Okay, wonderful, Stephen, you are on. Uh, we have a small lunch break, but for other people, go ahead. All right, everyone, glad to be back. So this is a um, this 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 is a a, a little different uh, session. I I had hoped to have my students speaking with me, but um, we uh, have had a long weekend here, and so uh, my students, most of my students, are either out of town or were una unable to get in. So that's okay. Um, but they did ask me to share the the one big thing they wanted me to share was this graph that is rotating on your screen. Uh, that is a monkey saddle. And you can see the equation over on your left-hand side. And so this is a, um, these students were in or are in a multivariable calculus class. So this is essentially a Calc 3 class. These students are seniors. So they're all 17, 18 years old. Most of these students had Algebra 2 here in the United States, Algebra 2 as eighth graders. So they had pre-calculus as freshmen. Then they, they took calculus, AP calculus AB as sophomores, AP Calculus BC as juniors. So they had kind of two years of an AP Calculus course. And then they're in a um, multivariable course because everyone needs to everyone needs to make sure they take a math class their senior year. So it's a little bit different uh, co uh, course. Um, let me share some of the resources. So if you if you were interested in like how could I get kids working in a multivariable class? Let me share some of the resources that I've used. And then we'll come back and show you a little bit how my students are using GeoGebra to um, help them visualize the things that are having difficulty seeing in, um, in 3D. And this is not certainly not gonna take the entire time and I know it's lunch and you guys probably need a little bit of lunch yourselves. So. Um, uh, this is, I dropped this in the chat earlier. I will drop it again, this link. So uh, this link is a uh, tiny URL. This will take you to, uh, to this course. Um, our first resource, uh, this is, um, this is the, the textbook that we are following. It is free. It's an open education resource called OpenStax. And, uh, I, I will share a little bit of the uh, table of contents. So my students typically read this um, within their course, and I will show you that as well. But um, you can you can see that it starts with parametric equations and polar coordinates. Those and chapter two, those are kind of the last two topics that um, well that the kids kind of work with in calculus BC. Um, vectors in space. And then we follow that up with vector valued functions, uh, differentiation, partial derivatives. They're getting ready to start multiple integration. And um, uh, I'm, hoping that, I'm hoping that we have enough time to get to vector calculus. We probably will not get to second order differential equations this year, only because we tried a couple of different things at the beginning of the year before we actually settled on this. The kids really, um, uh, the kids needed a little more support and this certainly provides the support, the support. But I'm hoping that we get to um, all of these uh, major theorems in chapter six, the Green's theorem, um, Stokes' theorem, the Divergence theorem, and that we can um, talk about some of these fluid flow things that they might see. So uh, this is a, a fantastic resource. If, if you go to OpenStax, there are uh, tons of free, freely available, books to use. Um, they are, I, I would not say they're not aligned with like advanced placement. However, the um, like algebra and trigonometry in the top is appropriate for a pre-calculus book. And you've got algebra and algebra two books. So they're all, they're all available. And the stats books are pretty good too. And there's some pre-calculus books down here as well. 
freely available. So I'm always, I'm always about free stuff. Um, this is what we actually started the year with. And, and I'll be honest, this, my students love my students. They really struggled with this and it's understandable. So um, Phillips Exeter, they are a, uh, I don't wanna do it that way. Let me see if I can get to this this way. Um, my they are a, a uh, write their own curriculum and it's problem-based. So it's not a textbook per se, but it is essentially a collection of problems. So um, if I look at the first problem, that, that really threw the kids for a loop. Uh, this, this first question, um, which is essentially dealing with the hemisphere. But it, it, was, it, it was tough. So we worked through about the first 10 pages and it really took them a while. Um, everything, so I, I think it would have been better had they gone through more um, of the earlier Phillips Exeter things to kind of had a feeling for how this would work, but this is very problem centric and that would, they are very uh, much rule followers. Like if, if you kind of show me a procedure, I will follow that procedure to the very end. Um, so this is not like that. This is something that gets kids to kind of develop the procedures as they go and maybe to develop their own procedures. So, but this is an, uh, Phillips Exeter has some awesome, awesome things on their website. So that is that thing. Let's see, let me go back to my um, my book. Uh, another thing that we use, which is uh, also very nice, is this uh, Math Libre text. Th this also has a free, um, kind of a free online textbook that is, uh, has a lot of nice, a lot of nice digital resources and visualizations that are available. And so my students are also using some of these resources as well. Um, but again, th these are free things. So if you, if you had some kids who you think might be ready to do this, let them try that. And of course we use Khan Academy. I'm not gonna click on Khan Academy, but I think their multivariable course on Khan Academy is actually pretty good. And, and, and I actually think that this Khan Academy at times does get a bad rap, but I think some of the things they offer um, advanced math things and computer science things are top notch. Um, what I use in my course is when, this is my first year at this school. And one thing they asked for me to do is to, be, is to better track the progress of these students. So this, this multivariable course for seniors is um, billed, if you will, as an, as an independent study. And uh, in the past, it, was really more just like an open period for the kids. The kids did very little work on multivariable and the teacher who was running at the time really couldn't tell exactly where they were. And so one of the things they asked me when I took over for this teacher this year in my position is to, um, is to better track the students. So what I'm using is something called My Open Math. And My Open Math is a free learning management system. And you can see here, I, have a, uh, I actually have a business calc class set up and a calculus BC class, which I used earlier, but I've not used that anymore for my uh, advanced placement kids. Um, I also have a, uh, another calculus class for my non-AP kids. And then I have my multivariable. So if I can click on my multivariable, you can kind of, or if I can zoom in a little bit, there you go. So it's very much a learning management system. Um, my students are right now working on this uh, module. And next year, I'll know I'm going to start with this instead of trying to work through the Phillips Exeter stuff. I, that I probably lost almost a quarter. Um, so in three quarters, they're, they're doing pretty well, but it's kind of limiting how far we get. Most of the, stu most of the students, um, I mean, we ran across much of this content earlier in the year in this chapter, so they're doing okay. And um, they're probably going to finish up this chapter this week. And we'll move on to uh, chapter five, double integrals. This course is already set up. So if you go to My Open Math, if you just go to My Open Math, you can um, create a teacher account. And when, when you get accepted, when your teacher account gets approved, you can add a new course. And you, what you can do is you can copy these courses that already exist. So the multivariable course follows the OpenStax textbook that I shared earlier and loosely kind of also follows that Libre text. 
So um, again, this is a, a fantastic resource, but I can I can track um, what my students are doing in in real time and in regular time. For example, I can see what their grades are like. So let's see. And then the next thing I think is, oh, I want to zoom. <coughs> Um, what my students, the one thing my students asked me to share with you that they just wanted, they, they said a couple of things, but they all said is they wanted me to share a monkey saddle. So if you're not familiar with a monkey saddle, let's do that now. So if you would like to try to follow along with me for the next little chunk of time, um, I'm going to go back to GeoGebra. And if, if you were with me, um, if you were with me this morning, you know that I prefer GeoGebra Classic. So in the middle column, the ready for tests, I'm gonna click on GeoGebra Classic. And when this opens up, when this opens up, um, on, on the right, I'm gonna delete this. I was doing some other things, so I don't wanna recover that. On the right-hand side of my screen, I've got this menu that opens up. If that menu doesn't open up, that's not a problem. I'll show you how to get there. So I'm just going to click over here and close that menu. And then in the upper right-hand corner, there is that pancake stack or that like a hamburger, the three horizontal lines. I'm going to click on that. And then about halfway down, it says perspectives. I'm going to click on perspectives. And the perspective I want to use is 3D graphics. So perspectives are nothing more than kind of pre-configured windows, if you will. So I'm gonna click on 3D graphics and then we'll pause here for a moment. So I'll show you a monkey saddle. We'll come back to a monkey saddle. We might not do much with it right away, but or maybe we will, we'll see what happens. So a monkey saddles equation uh, looks like this. It starts with an X, cubed. And I, I love how GeoGebra kind of graphs things as you go. So it's x cubed in the plane. And then I will go up minus 3 and then y squared and then toggle out of that and then times x. And if you want times, just put a little space in there and that will work. So this is a monkey saddle. Why monkey saddle? Let me zoom in just a tad here. So the reason this is <laughs> referred to as a monkey saddle, one, it has a saddle point there at the, at the origin. But if you could imagine the two legs kind of sticking off, a monkey, if a monkey sits there, the two legs would stick off on the left and right on either side of the x-axis and the tail would flop back uh, this way along the negative y-axis. So that is a monkey saddle. So, th so there's a couple of things that, um, that we would like to do with a monkey saddle. And this is some of the things that, and we'll, we'll kind of jump into this, but then we'll back up a little bit as well. And I'll kind of show you where it comes from. And that may be about all we do, but we'll see. I certainly want to make sure that if you have any questions about multivariable or trying to do this with some of your kids that we can get those questions answered. So I'm just going to, um, I, I just want to plot a point that is on this, that is on this monkey saddle. And so I'm going to keep it nice and easy. Um, I'm just, my point is going to be at the X coordinate one and the Y coordinate zero. And then to get my uh, Z coordinate, I'm going to use the A function of right above. <coughs> Excuse me. One comma zero. And so there it is. It's hard to see. It's hard to see. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the settings. And I was noticing this earlier, and I don't know if Marcus is on here. I used to be able to change the point size up here in the upper right-hand corner, and I don't seem to be able to change my point size anymore. So I'm going to click on the three dots, and then I'm going to go to a settings, and I'm just going to um, 
what I'd like to do is change the size of that point so it's easier to see. And so that that's the style of the point. And I'm just going to make it as large as I possibly can. And then I want to make the color pop a little bit. So I'm going to go to the color tab. And I'm going to choose a, a bright color. You might not like the color I choose, but choose a color that's suitable for you. And I want to make it a little bit brighter so it pops off that dark color, uh, that blue color on the surface. And so I think I might use like a uh, this bright green. We'll see how that works. And if it doesn't work, I'll just change it. Perfect. Perfect. And that point's name is A, and that point is now hiding behind. Now, while you are in this uh, in the 3D view, if you click in, in like an empty space, like if I click on the surface or the point, my, my style bar changes. I'm going to click in an empty space. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to hide the gray plane. That is the XY plane. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this little icon here. I still want the axes to show, but I don't want the gray plane to show. So I'm going to click on the axes without a gray plane there. And if you're curious what the other things do, there is just the gray plane with no axes. There is the gray plane with the axes, and there's nothing. So I'm just going to go there to, and I want the axes to show, but I do want to provide a little bit of depth or some like a place where the, like the kids can kind of reference. So I am going to show my grid. So I found my kids have found that useful. They like to show the grid, even though it's hard to see. They like to at least be able to see like when they've tipped up on one side or another. And I'm going to hold down my shift key and kind of raise my grid up a little bit so it's a more centered. So my challenge is I would like to find a plane that is tangent to point A. And so one of the things that we tried to do is we tried to make this connection to our kids. If this was a point in the XY plane and you were trying to write the equation of a line through that point, or maybe it was if it was a line tangent to another curve, like we are doing tangent to a surface, you would probably need to know the, the slope of the tangent line at that point. And that would require a derivative. Well, we've got two derivatives here, depending on our direction. We have a derivative, a partial derivative with respect to x, and a uh, partial derivative with respect to y. And so we can find both of those easy. Now, my students, my students know how to do it without a calculator. They can do this without GeoGebra. So they could look at this, at this monkey saddle, and they could write the, uh, the partial derivative with respect to x, that would be 3x squared minus 3y squared. I think they can get that. But GeoGebra will do it for you. So I'm going to, let's see what happens. I don't know what's going to happen. I want to have control over its name. So I am going to call this dx. That's going to remind me that that's the partial derivative with respect to x. And th there is a command for derivative. So this is a nice support for my kids taking multivariable. I want them to really kind of try as many things, make as many pictures as possible to help them visualize things. And I want to take the derivative of function a up there in the top. And I want to do it with respect to x. So I'm going to go comma x. And so just like we mentioned that the derivative, the partial derivative of this function with respect to x is 3x squared minus 3y squared. I'm going to hide that function and let's do the same thing. My kids would know what it is to do the partial derivative with respect to y. Um, if I took the derivative with respect to y, the x cubed term would, uh, would be zero because you treat it as a constant. Um, and this would end up being, I treat the three x as a coefficient. So this would be six x y, negative six x y if we do this correctly. So let's give this a try. I'm going to call it dy. <coughs> Probably shouldn't, but that's what I'm going to do equals derivative, and I want the derivative of a, that's my function name up there in the top, it's the blue one at the very top, um, with respect comma y, with respect to y.
perfect, perfect, perfect. So let me hide this. Let me hide this again. So if I wanted to do a, um, what I'd like to do is that we can use these derivatives. It's very, it's very, very, very similar to point slope form. Very similar. So if, if I was going to do point slope form, I would go something like y equals the slope times x minus some x point plus um, some y, uh, the y coordinate of, of that same point. So this is what it would look like if I was going to do a point slope form equation in two dimensions. It would be slope times x minus x sub zero plus y sub zero. It, it's actually looks, oh, I did not mean to do that. So I'm gonna click on those numbers and see if I can delete them all in one fell swoop and I did. So we're gonna do um, something similar. It's gonna work the same way. So I'm gonna do the, um, I wanna find the tangent plane at point A, and this is how my students are kind of using this to support their work. Um, I'm gonna go uh, dx evaluated at one zero times x minus one. So that's kind of like the slope intercept part of it. And let's, I don't know what's gonna happen. Let's keep going. The partial derivative of with respect to y evaluated at one, oops, I hate when that happens. Why did it do that? Let me go back here, one zero. This is y minus zero. Might not like that now, I wonder what's happening, let's see. Please say you might not like my input, but we're gonna keep going, we're gonna keep going. And then if I was gonna find like that y intercept, I would um, just add on a of uh, one zero. And I want that to equal, I'll just leave like that, see what happens. Nah, it doesn't like that, D. Oh, I forgot my, I deleted out my X by mistake. Oh, there it is, there it is. So that is my equation. I could probably go equal Z, but this will automatically probably put in some sort of another function value for me. But this is a, one of the things that we did kind of a, a little earlier in the year. This, this came up, um, they're doing this again now in their My Open Math course, but this, this concept came up way earlier in the year when we were started out with the uh, Phillips Exeter materials. And uh, so they kind of developed this procedure, connecting it to point slope form in the plane. So they really did a nice job. There is, that looks pretty, yeah, I don't know if that's quite it. It's, it's hard because it, you're thinking, well, it intersects the plane, but it's, it is tangent there. It looks like it's tangent in both places. It looks like it's tangent. So, I mean, it kind of has the same slope as the surface does at that point. And so if we could have, if we would have rewritten this equation using the actual coordinates of A, instead of me typing in ones and zeros, we could have dragged A around and we could have seen how that, slope, how that plane changes. But that is one of the uh, first things that they did and they'll use that uh, tangent plane to do some um, approximations of function values in the area of A. So let's, let's back up just a little bit. Um, back when we started into our my open math and then we started working more with vectors. So I'm gonna open up a, a new, I'm gonna open up a new GeoGebra, a GeoGebra window and a new GeoGebra classic window, excuse me. And I still want my, um, I still wanna do a 3D perspective. So I'm gonna go up to that hamburger stack and I'm gonna go down to perspectives. And then I'm going to choose 3D graphics. So let's, let's back up just a little bit and see how they worked with vectors to find equations of planes. So um, my students know 
or they came to know at least during this, they probably were aware back when they, it, when they took geometry, but these kids took geometry um, when they were in seventh grade. So they are removed by five or six years from geometry. So I'm gonna put, I'm just gonna activate my point tool. And I'm gonna put a point here. I'm gonna put a point over, over there and I'm gonna put a point over there. And then before I do anything else, I'm gonna put this tool away. And then I'm gonna um, take the B axis. I'm gonna, um, you notice as I hover, it's got like a kind of a four pointed arrow. And if I hold the shift key down and well, actually I don't need to hold the shift key down. If I just click on it again, now the arrow goes up and down. There's two of them, which means I can click on the point and have it lift above the plane. And I'm gonna do the same thing with point C. I'm gonna lift that above the plane and I'll leave point A where it is. And so what I'd like to do is I, I would like to find the equation of the plane that passes through those three points. Now, certainly, and I, I, get, I get this. Jo guess what? I think Jojo is going to do this for me. Let's give this a try. Uh, so I bet if, if there was a command for plane, it would probably just be plane, sure enough. And I bet if I just typed in A comma B comma C, it would do it. And it did. What I'm interested in is where do these coefficients come from? Where does the 13.4 come from? Where does the 1.17 come from? Where does the 20.12 and the 21.47, where do those things come from? So let me hide that. So this goes back to some properties of vectors that, that we learned once we got into the MyOpen math text. So I'm going to create a vector. And one of the things I've also been trying to do is I've been trying to um, encourage my students to use commands. So if there was a command for a vector, it would probably go like vector. And I bet I could probably say, I want a vector that starts at A and goes to B. So it starts at A and it goes to B. You'll notice when I first typed in A, it drew a vector from the origin to A. That makes sense, but I wanted to start at A and I want to go to B. Likewise, I want another vector that starts at A and goes to C. Now, if the plane, if the plane was passing through those points, A, B, and C. Then the two vectors would also lie in the plane. And so what we can do is we could probably use something along the lines of a, of a dot product to write an equation for us. So in other words, we, if we could only find a perpendicular vector, but there is a perpendicular vector and that perpendicular vector, one of the things that we learned when we started in the open math course is that the cross product of two vectors is perpendicular to the two vectors that I took the cross product of. So if there was, if there happened to be a command it might start out as cross. And it turns out that it is just cross. And my vectors are uh, u and comma v. And so if I do this, you'll notice where it started out. That it, it kind of starts at the origin. That's OK. I will, um, I'll leave that where it is. I'm going to, but that is, that looks pretty good. That looks pretty good. So. Um, keep these, oh, take a gander at these numbers here. 13.4, 1.17, and 20.12. And then let me go back up here to my, to my plan, ah, 13.4, oh, hold on. 13.4, 1.17, Interesting, interesting, interesting. So those three, these three numbers, in my plane equation are the components of the cross vector of the cross product, the vector formed by the cross product. 
So there's a first kind of aha moment for my students. They, they've been working with planes, equations of planes, not really sure why it would happen, but it, it actually turns out that that's where that comes from. What I'm literally to, doing is a dot product of, of the cross product vector and any other vector. Now, where does this number on the other side come from? Where does this, um, where does this 21.47 come from? Well, this, any point that is on my plane must satisfy this equation. So in order for this to work, I could just plug the coordinates of one of my points in and hopefully it would work. So I could take, for example, a, a 13.4, and I wonder if I could do this. I'll take the x coordinate of a times the x coordinate of a. Let me, I should, let me do this differently. Let me take the x coordinate of w times the x coordinate of a plus the y coordinate of w times the y coordinate of a. And if I did one more, that I will do the z coordinate of w, not two, times the z coordinate of a, but the z coordinate of a is zero. So you can see that this is nothing more than the dot product of vector w and that vector that actually initially showed up from the origin to a. So I'm literally taking the dot product of these two vectors. Let's, so let me try this and see what happens. So there is that number. That number is there. 21.47, there's 21.47 there. Oh man, let me try this. Let me go vector A again. I wonder if, I wonder if we can do this. I wonder if we can make this happen. So there's my vector A. B is, <laughs> B is its name, sorry about that. B equals vector A. And then W is this cross product. I wonder if there is a command for dot. I bet that's it. B comma W. Let's see if we can find it. There it is. That's the dot product of vector B and W, this little vector here and that vector there. All right, let's see. That is probably kind of kind of like at that point where if I did more, I probably wouldn't have enough time to get it in well. And um, I think what I'll do, since it is your lunchtime and there's more stuff going on this afternoon, if you would, if you have any questions, drop those questions in the chat um, and, and let me know. And if there's something you'd like to see um, in 3D. We can show that, so I'll leave my screen up here. I'm kind of, but I'm kind of hesitant to start something up in about 15 minutes because I really don't think we'll have enough time to knock all that stuff out. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Is there any questions for Stephen? Is there any question for Steve? Uh, in here we have lunch time, so there is no questions from the room. <laughs> I figured that. I figured that, and I know the folks online would probably like to get up and stretch their legs if they've been sitting all morning. No, no, this is we still have people online, and we are also recording. And there's a question uh, that is: um, Is it possible to print all the previous uh, stuff in 3D? Do you know anything about printing? Uh, see if you can say something about printing in 3D. 3D printing. So let me do this. Let me back up. I'm going to close a couple of windows out here because I've actually um, I do a 3D print of the day. I try to at least, and I usually post it on Twitter when I do that. So I'm going to go back to my. Um, let me go back to my uh, profile on GeoGebra, and I will show you how I do my 3D printing. So typically, let's see. Let me. Uh, I've th uh, so this is something that I um, 3D printed yesterday. So um, this is that um, that kind of a circle, square, and triangle where when I look at it from the bottom. It's a circle. 
When I look at it from this side, it's a square. When I look at it from this side, it's a, an isosceles triangle. So this is something that I built uh, yesterday and I started the 3D prints and uh, it did not finish yet. But so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna um, go to the three dots in the upper right-hand corner and I'm gonna open this uh, in the app. So when I click on open in app, this will open in GeoGebra Classic for me. And then this will allow online. me- yes. But it is still online. This is not on your computer. You I am know. still, I am online. The only thing I'm gonna have online here in a second is my slicer. And when I, and let me see if I can, I need to move this thing around. I, every window in Zoom is always where you don't want it. But do you notice that? So anyway, in the, it, so this is the thing I wanna print. And what I've done is I've, hot, I've hid everything else. I've hid the axes, I've hid the labels, I've hid the lines, like the grid lines that typically show up on the surface. You need to hide everything because if you don't hide it, it's going to want to print it. So hide everything. And then I'm going to go to the upper right corner. I'm going to click on that pancake stack. And under the file menu, I can download as. So when I download as, my, one of my choices is at the bottom is 3D print. And what I do is I click on 3D print and on this next window that, sh that, sh that appears, I check off the filled solid box. So what that does, it, it knows like, oh, I'm gonna fill this in, but it's, it's not solid because my slicer sets that up for me. So, so let me download this for a moment. Let me download this. I'll leave it like that name is fine. And then let me up, my slicer is this Cura slicer down here. This, now the Cura, ooh, you probably will not see the Cura slicer unless I'm, um, let me, um, let me stop my sharing and let me share again. I'm gonna share my entire screen so you can see my Cura Slicer. So here I am, Cura Slicer. I'm gonna drag this puppy over to my Cura and give that a second to show up. And, and this is, a, so it, it probably took what I set up yesterday. It was set up to be about six hours to print. Usually what I do is I start it out in the morning and I let it run all day. And that way by the last period of the day when my multivariable kids come in, usually it's completed, but the kids throughout the day. Puppy? Can you, show, can you show right now this uh, anything in, you can show now us? No, yeah. all my 3D things are at school. Do I have oh. anything? I don't No, I do not. Okay. I do not have anything I can show. It, it's a, um, yeah, so I usually I've been printing like two things that kind of fit together like puzzle pieces, like a monkey saddle is a perfect thing to print. If you print two monkey saddles, they will fit one on top of the other. But uh, yeah, so this is, this is, uh, we'll... so here it is. And without any uh, changes to the size or the, or the uh, if I slice it, it will give us a time as how long it will take. And my guess is that might take about three hours. We'll see. Ah, just over an hour. So that would not be bad. I should have started this this morning. Kasha, then I would have had something. So that's that's oh. my workflow. That is oh. that is my workflow. The, the thing is, is you need to hide everything in GeoGebra. So hide all the labels, hide any other lines that you don't want to see, hide the axes because if you don't hide those things, it's going to want to print all of that stuff too. So great question. Great question. Any other questions, kids? And if not, I think we are we are slowly getting out of questions. As a very right. intensive day. Thank you so much. You are welcome. I'm I'm glad I got to be there. Maybe next year I'll be down there. 
in Absolute. person. Absolutely, and uh, share lunch. We have really delicious lunch <laughs> and the mm. good weather. So uh, we hope to see your team and other people in person. It'll be wonderful. All right. And uh, there's a question, what printer do you have? I have an Ender 3 Pro, Creality. So it's um very much, very inexpensive. It's a kit and I, have, and I put it together. That's something we did a couple of years ago when I was coaching at, at our um, local ESC. So a Creality Ender 3 Pro. Nice. And the software you are using, it comes with it, yes? The software is, um, no, it doesn't come with it, but I, that's Ultimakers Slicer, and that's a free download. So you can download it. It works really well, and it, it has preset, presets for the printer that I use. Okay, so I, I have one more question. What would you think for students will be the most uh, mo profitable to see uh, uh, going out of printer? What do you think is, is blowing their minds, steering their interest, or maybe uh, get them deeper understanding of math? They, they really like, um, I've taken some of my Pythagorean, well, I think Karen is gonna talk about this next, is the, uh, um, in her Pythagorean party, what I've done is I've taken some of my Pythagorean theorem puzzles and turned those into um, 3D printed pieces where you can arrange them into like either two squares or three squares. So that, that often leaves kids challenged and stumped for a while. They also like when I print out two of the exact same pieces and they can <laughs> fit together as like puzzle pieces would into like a cube. So that's another thing. Those are the things they tend to kind of like, things that they kind of make them think that they like holding them, like running their hands on them. So it's cool. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Right. Any questions here? There are a lot of people, thinking, thank you very much, amazing. Uh, and also, of course, we are having the uh, recording. I am repeating that because not everybody is here that well. We will be ha having recording. This recording will be sent to GeoGebra and it will be on GeoGebra YouTube channel in a couple of weeks. Uh, and, and also it's, uh, it's very, very good to check out the last year conference and uh, the recording we have uh, as well. And um, thank you so much, Stephen. I, I'm so happy, you know, we have here some discussion backstage, but people are used to do online, but I think the in-person is, is so amazing. So I hope to- Next year. You. Next year, let's do it. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Thank Bye. you, Steve. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Okay, thank you so much. So right now we are having um, a, a short break. Um, so if you have any question, I have seen some people uh, 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 wanted to contact organizer. So right now the best way to contact organizer is probably to contact me. Um, or of course, um, uh, Samantha Cruz is also uh, good, but let me just put again my email address. Okay, w. I am putting it in the chat. So if you have questions, there was something about the participation, um, uh, uh, certification, things like that, you can do it, please contact us. The next guest will be uh, Petra Surinkova. She will talk about geometry, then we will have uh, Karen um, Kempe, uh, Peter Grant party. And we are sorry they have a, a shorter times because this is this is what happened that uh, we have so wonderful speakers. Um, so like uh, 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 if Petra is ready, we can start a little bit earlier if you don't mind, Petra. Petra is here. Uh, Petra, do you want to start earlier? Uh, five minutes, okay. <laughs> Okay, so five minutes break. I stop recording right now. <laughs>